Yes, miracles do occur. Michael Cora made a hockey reference. Probably the last one ever. Now, there is uh, something distasteful, even obscene, frankly, about anti-gun zealots exploiting another shooting tragedy even before all of the dead have been identified. Surely, surely grace and decency require at least a hiatus of respect. But if the fanatics scream, we the moderates, we have to speak. Police say 34-year-old gunman Aaron Alexis went into the Washington Navy Yard and started shooting. And as he came around the corner, he aimed his gun at us and, and he fired at least two or three shots. The gunfire killed 12 people ages 46 to 73, none of them military personnel, all civilians or contractors. Alexis also died. He was a contractor who began at the Navy Yard just last week. Court records show Alexis was arrested in 2004 in Seattle for shooting out the tires of a car and what Alexis told detectives was an anger-fueled blackout. In 2010, he was arrested for firing a gun through his apartment ceiling. He said he was cleaning the gun when it went off. The Washington Post reports he was arrested in Georgia in 2008 for disorderly conduct. And more of that later. But look, what occurred in Washington yesterday was was horrible. And it demonstrated once again why law-abiding moral people are safer when armed. Yes, I did just say that. Consider a few questions, please. Do you feel intimidated when you visit a farm in the United States or in Canada, for that matter? Are you afraid of the idea of visiting Switzerland? Certain that the streets of Geneva and Zurich are dripping red with the blood of gun crimes? Well, of course you're not. Of course you're not. But North American farmers pretty much all have guns, lots of them. And the Swiss, they own guns, weapons in extraordinary high numbers. So the conclusion is obvious, isn't it? The problem is not one of guns, but one of crime. Not one of weapons, but of evil. Look, in 1945 in the UK, and I'm sure Canada was pretty much the same, tens of thousands of, of brave men from the army, they brought enemy handguns home from the war. They weren't stored very well. Kids played with them. But it was very safe to be a young person, any person in those days. The reason was that family structure was strong. Father told sons how to behave, chastised them with love if they didn't do so. Morality was considered absolute. Concepts of right and wrong dominated. And, oh, the sheer horror, people still assumed and believed that God was God. I know it's terrible, isn't it? It's really... Quite simple, you know. Well-formed people raised in a loving home with a strong sense of authority generally won't shoot innocent people any more than they will stab them, kick them, or beat them to death. How fascinating it is that the very sort of people, have you noticed this, who campaign the loudest and longest to control guns are generally the same sort of people who believe in shorter sentences for offenders and the liberal permissive raising of children. Which is not to say that there aren't zealots on the other side as well. Some of the gun advocates in the United States can be, well, crazy, irrational at times. But that doesn't obscure the justice of their argument. Better them than the Hollywood celebrities who make millions of dollars through their movies where idiots shoot idiots, blood squirts, guns abound, and then make those irritatingly maudlin commercials telling us that guns are a curse. Columbine. I like the way you die, boy. Kill all the white people in the movie. <laughs> How great is that? Virginia Tech. Tucson. Aurora. <laughs> Fort Hood. Oak Creek. <laughs> Newtown. <laughs> Newtown. If it wasn't so tragic, it would be absolutely bloody funny. It's... It... If only we could shoot hypocrisy dead, but only with legal firearms, of course. There have to be controls. There have to be controls. We have to make sure that only sane, good people have access to guns. But the role of government it should be to keep guns from the bad, not take them from the good. 
And in case you're wondering, I don't own a gun. I'm not really even particularly interested in guns, but I am interested in freedom. And I'm so tired of extremists reacting rather than considering. There is no compelling evidence, there really isn't, that gun control prevents crime. But there's libraries of evidence that criminals will use anything, including guns, to hurt others and to break the law. Listen to the peacemakers. Listen to the neutrals. Listen to the makers of chocolate and cheese. Yes, listen to the Swiss. You will take my common sense from my cold, dead brain. As he came around the corner, he aimed his gun at us and he fired at least two or three shots. I heard three shots. Pow, pow, pow. He raised and aimed at us and fired and he hit high on the wall. He simply walked up to try to say, hey, there's a shooter in your building. And that's when he got shot. Long Gunter joins us, columnist Edmonton's son. Lorne, a couple of things have to be said here. This happened in an area of strict gun control. And yet again, the person who did it was mentally ill. He, he was crazy. We shouldn't be criticizing the, the gun control element here. We should be criticizing doctors and bureaucrats who allowed him to be free. Yeah, at least as much as, as anything else. I mean, you, you have here a, a man with at least two run-ins with the law that were firearms related, one in 2004 and another in 2010. Uh, and then several unspecified incidents of misbehavior, misconduct, when he was a Navy reservist that caused him to be drummed out of the U.S. Navy Reserve. Uh, and then didn't seem to have any trouble at all getting clearance to work in a secure area in, inside the, the D.C. Navy Yard. Yeah. So uh, he, there's where the flaw is. I mean, how did the man get access, not to guns necessarily, that's you know, easy enough to do with the right amount of money, but how did he get access to the people that he killed? Yeah. You know, that, that, that is what really puzzles me. You know, it's fascinating you, you're, you're talking about gun control and, and, and the push to, to, to get uh, more control over guns every time one of these happens. But nobody, as you correctly say, pushes to have more control over the mentally ill. I mean, there's, there's still very few involuntary committal laws in, uh, in Canada and the United States and Western Europe. It's very difficult to be forced to go to a mental institution unless you've committed a crime and the judge orders it during part of your sentence, which very seldom happens, it's, it's very, very difficult to do. So you know, people who need help don't get it because we're worried that we're going to be offending their rights if we send them away to a mental facility. So, you know, there's lots of that that happens as well. Mm. But there are a lot of questions that we need to ask, and it's so quick after the tragedy, I, I don't anyway want to exploit this, but America in many ways is over-policed. Uh, you, you travel to the United States, you go through the most absurd levels of security for people who do not intend anyone any harm. You have too many people in uniform who think that they're, they're self-important. But in this case, a man with such a record was granted access. There was a perfunctory look at his documentation before he went in. And of course, he committed this terrible crime. Now, let's emphasize here, most people with mental health issues are completely peaceful and are generally victims rather than perpetrators. But time after time, the people who've committed the crimes have not only had some mental health issue, but, and I think this is vital, most of them, even those who are apparently sane, have given warning signals if it, anyone had the intelligence to see them. Absolutely. Look, uh, look at, at Major Hassan and, and the Fort Hood yes, shooting. He yes. gave all sorts of indications he was prepared to do something like that. And no one, because of political correctness, no one was prepared to step in and stop him. I mean, another thing, though, that's very interesting, and you draw the connection between uh, you know, gun control uh, activists and, and these sorts of in instances. Last month uh, at Harvard, there was a very interesting study put out, and it's particularly interesting because it comes from Harvard. And Harvard, of course, is known for its liberal mentality. It, it examined gun ownership and murder and suicide rates in all the Western European countries, plus the United States and Canada. And it found some fascinating things. For instance, Norway has the highest percentage of gun ownership yep. in Western Europe, 32%. It also has the lowest murder rate. Mm -hmm. but Finland, with 10 times the official gun ownership rate of the Soviet, of Russia, of, of, of the Russian Federation, 10 times the gun ownership rate has one-tenth the murder rate. 
So you're absolutely right. The people who intend to do you violent harm will find some uh, weapon to do that with. It's, it's the person who's using, who wants to do you harm that you have to control, not the weapon, because murderers, rapists, robbers, assaulters will find some way of committing their crime, mm. even if guns are made difficult for them to access. Of course they would. And you know, I, I'm loath to mention National Socialist Germany, but some of the most rigid gun control laws in history existed in, in, in Nazi Germany. The, the, the idea that um, evil people are just waiting to get hold of a gun, evil people will use whatever they can and good people will defend themselves. There are numerous examples of this, for example, in Israel, where because criminals know other people have guns, they're reluctant to commit crimes. It, Absolutely. It, it, this goes on and on, but the debate is wide open, and of course Hollywood has taken sides, and it's far too tragically influential. Always a pleasure having you on the show, my friend. Thank you. Good night, Michael.